Hello, everybody. Thank you very much for joining. We will just wait for a couple of seconds until more um, come online, and then we'll start the webinar. So um, let's wait for 30 seconds or so, and then we'll start. So good afternoon again to everybody joining us in Asia and good morning to our European audience. I'm very happy to be here today with this distinguished panel and to discuss the online markets for pangolin derived products, particularly those related to traditional Chinese medicine. Um, pangolins are known to be among the world's most trafficked animals, and we know that the Internet plays a major role in the trade of pangolin derived products across various jurisdictions. In uh, July this year, the Global Initiative published a new report on the online market for pangolin derived products authored by my colleague um, Theo Clement. Today, we will hear from him some of the key findings of the report. He will also tell us more about the Monitoring Market Friction Unit, the team behind this um, research, and the Cascade tool with which they gathered the data. Um, we will soon post a link in, of the report into the chat, and we invite you all to have a look at it. During this webinar, we will also hear from Dan Tallender from the University of Oxford and from Sarah Scam from the Environmental Investigation Agency about their work on illicit wildlife trade and how this new study relates to their research findings. I will introduce the speakers in more detail in a second, but I just wanted to announce some housekeeping. Uh, specifically on uh, Q&A. After the presentations, there will be a lot of time for Q&A. And so please put any questions that you might have throughout the whole webinar in the chat box. There is also a Q&A function, I believe, uh, that you can use, and we will try to get back to you soon. So as a way of starting the webinar, I would like to introduce you quickly to our speakers. Theo Clement is a senior analyst at the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organized Crime and works with the monitoring, Market Monitoring and Friction Unit, short MMFU. He is also one of the authors of the report we will talk about today. As a knowledgeist by training, Theo has been working in sanction monitoring and anti-trafficking since 2014. Our second speaker is Dan Schallender. He is a research fellow at the University of Oxford and is affiliated with the Interdisciplinary Center for Conservation Science at and the Oxford Martin School. Prior to joining Oxford, Dan worked with the International Union for the Conservation of Nature Global Species Program, where he led the organization's contribution to CITES and broader illegal wildlife trade work. He has a particular interest in pangolins, and he focuses his research on pangolins and their conservation as well as uh, wildlife trade policy. And our third speaker today is uh, Sarah Scam, who is a wildlife campaigner at the Environmental Investigation Agency, an NGO that investigates and campaigns against environmental crime and abuse. Her research covers law enforcement efforts against wildlife trafficking in Africa and China, the expansion of traditional Chinese medicine in Africa, and Chinese policies related to wildlife protection and use. Um, thank you um, very much for joining this um, panel and webinar today. Uh, my name is Christina Amahaus. I'm a program manager at the Global Initiative, and I'll be your moderator today. Um, I think this is really a fascinating piece of research, and I'm very much looking forward to the discussion. And with that, I would like to hand over to Theo to give us a quick overview of his recent research. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Christina, for the for the very kind introductions. Uh, good morning to everyone and good evening to everyone uh, in the audience. I'm very thrilled to be here today. Uh, thank you very much for tuning in. But before I forget, uh, I am uh, the lead author of the report, but it also benefited from the input of uh, Simon Hasem, who is the head of the Market Monitoring and Friction Unit within the Global Initiative, and from Jack Pay, who is the data engineer. <coughs> been helping us uh, using a tool called the Cascade that I will come back uh, 
to in a, in a second. Of course, Dan Challenger, the second speaker today, was also very instrumental in the in the research pro uh, in the research process. Um, so I'm going to start my presentation right now. I uh, yeah yeah. Here you go. Um, and I will start with the beginning of the research, the very first steps, which is the methodology on the second slide. Yeah, exactly. Um, uh, the methodology here, the methodology part of the research is actually something that is pretty important for us um, because uh, frankly speaking, this project was both an attempt at producing some uh, actual evidence and some solid findings on the, the online trade of pangolin derived products uh, in China, uh, in Chinese language and in English. Uh, it was also an attempt at using uh, an innovative methodology to track and monitor uh, the online trade, the online wildlife trade. And for that, we relied mostly on a machine learning web scraping tool called the Cascade. So the Cascade is a machine learning driven uh, web scraper, something that helps to scrape uh, the entire entire chunks of the of the web in order to find um, interesting uh, data, and interesting information that was designed and is operated by our partner institution, uh, the Center for the Analysis of Social Media Chasm, based in. In the UK. Um, so the Cascade is platform and language uh, agnostic, so you don't really have to tell it where to find information. It actually is able to process massive amounts of information and find uh, the data that you are looking for, even places where you not you don't think you 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 would find in there. It allows to conduct large scale and keyword uh, keyword based uh, searches. For this project, we choose to focus on Chinese, English, and Vietnamese. For mostly technical reasons, uh, we were not able to actually include the Vietnamese language detections in our final data set, but we will be publishing another report um, later this month or maybe next month focusing on, on Vietnam that does include some of the of the pangolin focused data that was uh, collected with the, with the cascades. We've been looking at the trade of pangolin parts, uh, pangolin scales, and uh, pangolin-derived products, in particular TCM drugs, so traditional Chinese medicine drugs, pangolin wine, incense, sorry for the typo, as well as uh, raw and processed uh, scales. <clears throat> so our goal here was to obtain the largest possible data set uh, related to the online trade of pangolin-derived products. It's been mostly a success so far. And uh, using that data set, the point was to not only identify the actors that are involved in this trade, not only doing something focused on networks, focusing on entities, focusing on the, the keynotes within the network, but also, uh, and that's thanks to the, 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 the magnitude of the, of the data set we were able to scrape um, to better understand the, the, the structure of the market. Um, where do people buy the most, uh, sell the most uh, pangolin derived products? Uh, the point, I mean, the, 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 the final objective was to see how this normally extremely regulated trade, I mean, as we'll discuss later uh, during, the, during the, the discussion, pangolins, uh, the trade of pangolin CITES is listed in, in Appendix 1 of CITES, it's extremely well regulated, but still it's, uh, the trade of pangolin scales and pangolin derived products is still able to continue and the big question was why and how at least for the for the online parts um the cascade uh the use of the cascade for the monitoring of online trade is actually uh delivering promising results i will definitely come back to that later in the discussion but as you can see on the next slides we were able to uh, find quite a lot of detections that uh once coded by human analysts, uh, were able to, to deliver some interesting uh, lessons about the, the state of the online market for pangolin derived products. Next slide, please. 
So as you can see here uh, on the top left corner, um, we first uh, we first dealt with, with uh, we, we first collected a grand total of more than six thousand initial detections. But after several rounds of uh, cleaning and coding by human analysts in order to um, verify uh, the, the quality of the links that we were actually dealing with what we were aiming for. Just, so it's not just uh, uh, an automated web scraper looking for data, it's actually providing us with detections, with links, what we call detections, but that's it, it's always uh, verified and, uh, and cleaned by human analysts. In the end, we only selected 924 uh, final links, which is more slightly more than 15% of the of the grain total. It seems quite low, but it's actually uh, pretty much standard, um, depending on how, what kind of uh, web scraping you are you are doing. But it comes with a lot of uh, false positive initially, and then you do a second round, and you are able to feed back some of the results back in the cascade, and basically the yields of the eviction gradually improves over time in order to um, have a core of uh, relevant detection for, for this study. Among these 924 links, 924 detections, uh, the overwhelming majority of them were coming from China, Chinese websites, not necessarily in Chinese language, but coming from Chinese websites. Uh, so 881 of them, 16 were from the US, which is interesting too and the remainder was mostly from hk from mostly from hong kong i think we got eight detections and europe uh, mostly if i remember correctly the uk and the netherlands the other the overwhelming uh, part of the detections were related to tcm manufactured drugs uh with a with Pangolin wine, uh, incense, and raw scales. I think we even uh, we even have one detection for a, a raw uh, dead uh, pangolin. Um, we are actually very, very, very far behind. Uh, pharmaceutical products made uh, 870 uh, detections out of uh, more than 900. So it's really the the, the 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 big issue here when it comes to when it comes to the online trade of pangolin derived products it's actually mostly focused on on tcm and contrary to we had been able to identify during our literature review uh the maybe most well-known drugs uh, the drugs that are most well known to contain uh, pangolin scales like things like guilin tea or Gongyuan in china that are manufactured by major uh, TCM manufacturing companies in China are not actually the one that comes most often in the detections. The most, dete the most detected drugs uh, are concurrent Tiaonang Shen ruling, which is used for lactation, and Chen Li uh, Tiaonang, which do sometimes appear in the literature as drugs that are known to contain pangolin, but definitely not as much as uh, things like Wei Yi and Gong Yuan, who are produced by uh, state-owned companies in, uh, in China. Next slide, please. So in terms of findings, I'm only going to focus on the key takeaways here. You'll find the details in the, in the, in the reports. Uh, but we've been able to identify key players in the online trade of pangolin-derived products. Uh, we've been trying to reach out to them through what we call private sector engagement. We've been, uh, that was not unfortunately a success. It's a bit difficult to reach out to uh, these people and try to have a, a constructive discussion. <clears throat> we did also try, we did also identify a firm based in the US that is actually manufacturing uh, pangolin derived products using pangolin scales in California, which is very worrying because uh, the ability to manufacture drugs in an industrial capacity uh, suggest that you are able to import illegally necessarily illegally uh, pangolin scales in california we've been able to identify uh, the role played by agent websites which i think is one of the key highlights of the report um, these agents websites are uh, entities uh, companies that do not directly market uh, drugs containing pangolins but most of the time offer a range of service related to TCM medicines, 
and but uh, they do provide links to country to, to companies and websites that do uh, sell these uh, products. Basically, you log online with your you explain your symptoms, etc. And this company point to you point out to you uh, potential solutions for your health struggle. And some of them are actually pointing out towards drugs that contain pangolins. It's actually it's actually more than half of our detections, sixty four percent. And there is, it comes with a, a big issue when, when we look at it through the angle of uh, illicit trafficking, because these agent websites are actually not bound. Uh, they are not actually selling money, uh, pangolin drug drugs. So they are not really bound by uh, China's laws, uh, Chinese laws and regulations. And that's, uh, that's, obviously, a, that's obviously a key issue. It's also uh, these agents' website also contribute to direct to directing potential customers to audience towards unsustainable uh, TCM drugs, uh, but also it contributes to obfuscating uh, the existence of pangolin derived drugs because basically these customers are led to consume drugs without being explained and told that these drugs contain uh, pangolin products. Actually, uh, according to China's national wildlife law. Uh, Companies selling uh, pangolin drug products need to display a specific logo, which is called the China National uh, Wildlife Mark, on their small selling units. But it's not the case for online trade, which is a major loophole in the law. Because if you are purchasing certain kind of TCM drugs, um, you can actually purchase these drugs without being told or explained that these contain. Uh, Pangolin scales or different parts of uh, wildlife, and uh, as we found out during uh, during our research, this China National Wildlife uh, Mark logo is not present in whopping uh, ninety two percent of our detections, which is uh, of course a cause for concern. Uh, last, and I'll stop right there because I've been already speaking too much. The CNW uh, logo uh, information which is supposed to provide a uh, certain code and, and numbers that allows the proper tracing and to ensure of the compliance of uh, how the, the, the scales have been sourced, how they have been, what kind of authorization they've got from various relevant bodies uh, within China. It actually does not really work. We've been able to find several instances where um, the CNMW logo explained that's the source, the, 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 the scales were sourced from the wild or were or from a known origin, which is which is worrying and which goes against uh, China's own law. Um, I'm going to stop right there, uh, but we will come back later in the discussion in the, on the issue of uh, recommendations uh, that derive from these findings. Thank you very much, Theo. Um, thank you for presenting the key findings of the report especially also for uh, going a little bit more in detail on the geographical distributions of the websites and the types of products that you've identified in the research. Um, that's really um, quite fascinating. Um, I'm curious also to hear um, Dan and Sarah's thoughts on this uh, soon. Um, I hope we can speak a little bit more later um, about the labeling requirements and the agent websites, as you've just mentioned also in the recommendations. But for now, um, let me hand over to Dan. Um, then the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Christina, for the introduction. Um, I think my presentation is being loaded, which is which is great. Um, I'm going to provide some hopefully useful context and background to the use and trade of pangolins, and then touch upon some of the key results as I see them from the report, and then offer some reflections and, and some takeaways and think about um, how we can address this, this issue of um, overexploitation of pangolins um, going forward. Um, so on my next slide, um, I just want to highlight, of course, that eight different species of pangolins widely distributed in, in Africa and Asia. And on my, my next slide, um, I think important context here when we're thinking about regulating the use and trade of pangolins is that as a species, they've been used for thousands of years in many different ways, be this as traditional medicine in Pakistan, be this the use of their livers, their hearts, their eyes, their claws, 
uh, for a whole range of different applications, both in Africa and in Asia. They've been consumed as, as wild meat or bush meat. Um, their scales have been used for all sorts of applications, as I've said, to cure things like nosebleeds, address stomach ulcers, headaches. And there's also some non-medicinal uses as well to the scales. So in parts of Malaysia, for example, the claws, possession of the claws are used to keep away evil spirits and to protect people from witchcraft. So there's a long history of use and trade in pangolins. Next slide, please. And when it comes to international trade, there's actually a really long uh, history in terms of international trade in pangolin products as well, including on a commercial scale. Um, so we know from the literature that there were commercial scale trade in pangolin scales since at least the early 20th century. Some nice examples here, um, as far back as the early 1920s, there were scale, uh, trade in tens of tons of scales from Indonesia to East Asia, so to Hong Kong in this case, and that continued into the mid 20th century. Um, another example, uh, this one relates to the use of pangolin skins in the, the leather market in Taiwan. Tens of thousands of skins traded in the two decades there, the 50s and 60s, uh, and even into the 70s, actually, from Southeast Asia to Taiwan for the use of pangolin leather. So there's lots of exploitation of pangolins that's taken place historically. And since around 1970, national laws in pangolin range dates have, have started to be updated. Um, and that's meant that pangolins have been protected either, either totally or partially. So exploitation has been regulated to some extent. And with the advent of CITES in 1975, pangolins also received attention under CITES. So the three Asian species recognized at the time were included in CITES Appendix 2, and Temix ground pangolin was included in Appendix 1. Uh, next slide, please. And what has been the impact of these trade measures? Well, despite these laws being put in place in range countries in Africa and Asia, there's typically a pervasive lack of resources for, en for enforcement. Um, law enforcement agencies, be that uh, CITES authorities or protected area uh, rangers and agencies are, are, are typically chronically under-resourced, especially in some places in, in the global south. And that means that pangolin populations continue to be exploited um, illegally uh, for, for international trafficking. I guess positively, um, when the CITES parties decided to introduce zero export quotas for the Asian pangolin species in the year 2000, that appears to um, have all but led to the cessation in, of the international trade in skins to North America. Throughout the 1970s, 80s and 90s, much of the trade reported to CITES was in skins, and mainly of the Sunda pangolin, Manus javanica, mainly to uh, Mexico and, and, and North America, and that was for the manufacture and subsequent sale of leather products, things like boots and belts and wallets and that sort of thing. But the zero quarters appeared to have, uh, appeared to have knocked that part of the trade out. Um, unfortunately, it didn't deal effectively with trade that took place within Asia or uh, trade to Asian markets from outside of Asia. And I guess as many people in the room might be familiar with um, at the CITES COP in South Africa in 2016, pangolins were transferred from Appendix 2 to Appendix 1. We're now five years on. Um, trade is still ongoing. A lot of it now takes place um, illegally. And the trade that was taking place in African pangolins legally before this uh, listing is now taking place illegally. So the trade continues to take place and it does so underground. It's now more difficult to monitor as a consequence of that. Um, and one of the key consequences, I think, of this measure seems to be that um, extraction is ongoing, but it's now in the hands of organized crime groups, which means it is more difficult to monitor and it's more difficult to gauge the sustainability of extraction for international trade be it illegal in this case. Next slide, please. And at the same time, we've got contemporary use in Asia that's ongoing. So pangolin scales, for example, are used in Vietnam as, as well as China. In China, pangolins have been consumed for at least a thousand years. There's now a legal market for, for pangolin scales in China, as has been the case historically too. Um, and uh, in recent years, there's been around 26 tons of pangolin scales that have been released from stockpiles um, each year onto a legal market. And these scales are sold through designated hospitals. 
pangolin scales continue to be included in the traditional Chinese uh, medicine pharmacopoeia in China. They have been removed as a raw ingredient in parts of the pharmacopoeia, but they continue to be listed as an ingredient in patented medicines um, in another part of the pharmacopoeia. And typical uses in, in China for pangolin scales include things like helping uh, nursing mothers to lactate, to uh, help people to cure skin diseases and to improve blood circulation as well. But traditional Chinese medicine is a, is a dynamic system and recent texts indicate the use of pangolin scales in uh, medicines to help address uh, treatments for symptoms of cancer, so leukemia and breast cancer, for example. So there's an evolving use of pangolin scales as well which I think is uh, important to note. Um, the literature is, is mixed on the efficacy of scales. Uh, the Western literature, that certainly that I've looked at, suggests there is no efficacy of pangolin scales in, in uh, medicinal applications. Um, in contrast, some of the literature in China does report uh, on the efficacy of scales in dealing with things like um, mothers struggling to produce milk, um, that's been tested on, on various species, including mice, uh, but not humans to my, to my knowledge, uh, and also for veterinary applications as well. So pangolin scales are used in veterinary medicines to help cure things like mastitis in, in cattle. And when it comes to human use of pangolins, pangolin scales in places like Guangdong in southern China apparently, uh, appear to be apparently widely used. And some research that was done by Zhang et al in 2021, suggesting that in actual fact, a lot of people that are consuming pangolin scales are doing so to, to cure diseases. Next slide, please. <coughs> so I was interested in, in Theo's presentation earlier, some of the highlights for me from the report. Well, what we're looking at in terms of the online trade is this is mainly Chinese companies selling medicinal products, e.g. pills and creams and that sort of thing to Chinese consumers in a legal market, and there's a, a wide range of drugs that, that were identified to contain pangolins. Interesting, when it comes to the regulation of this trade, um, we know from the research that um, the products that are being offered for sale, they do appear to comply with the, the National Medical Products Association. So 81% of detections were, uh, uh, were abiding by the, the regulations that were introduced there, but a far fewer proportion of those uh, detections um, actually complied with the, the Chinese National Wildlife Mark regulation system. And I think this is an interesting avenue for research. You know, we can ask questions as to why that is the case. Um, why are the agencies, the actors, the products that are involved, why is why are they uh, working with some regulatory bodies and some regulatory marks, but without others? It'd be interesting to explore that. Um, on that point, um, the report goes into more detail on this, but the State Forestry and Grasslands Administration uh, fairly recently announced that this uh, Chinese national wildlife mark um, is being redesigned. And I think that's, uh, that's, that's welcome if it leads to more effective regulation of the trade. Our next slide, please. So some takeaways um, from the report for me. Um, Pangolin products appear to have social legitimacy with consumers in China. There's long been uh, a legal market. Um, it is regulated to some extent. Um, there does appear to be social legitimacy, and that likely means that the dem demand for pangolin scales and products that contain pangolin scales will persist. Despite the long use and trade of pangolin products in China, there's actually limited research on consumers of, of pangolin products or research on other stakeholders involved in, in pangolin trade and consumption in China. And I would argue that we actually need more research into consumer preferences, including the importance of different species in China. It's just the, the Chinese pangolin Manus pentadactyla that's included in the traditional pharmacopoeia, but we're seeing lots of trafficking in the scales of different species. What does that mean? And is that important to consumers or not? I think we also need to get a better handle on the market size for pangolin scales and other products in China, and that will allow us to think more deeply about sustainability and how we achieve sustainability when it comes to um, protecting wild pangolin populations. <coughs> Excuse me. And we also need to think about the actors that are involved as well. People that might be harvesting pangolins, people that might be trading pangolins, people that might be processing pangolin products. What are their incentives for engagement? What do they hope to achieve in the future? Do they want an ongoing trade? And if so, how are they going to fit into the trade system? When it comes to effective regulation of the legal trade, this is where I think we can probably um, 
work smarter. So if there is going to be a legal trade in pangolin scales, I would argue that it does need to be effectively regulated. And there are different tools that we can use to do that. <coughs> so there are things like smart regulation, which is a form of regulation that explicitly includes uh, the, the opinions and insights from different actors in any given system in the formulation of those regulations. And in doing so, you can actually achieve a higher level of compliance because people have been through a process that's hopefully fair uh, and they've had a chance to air their views on what regulation uh, and what reasonable regulation would look like to them. There are also other forms of regulation that we can use. So it doesn't just have to be state-led law enforcement, for example. There could be a third party involved, for example, that isn't the state and isn't an active player in the trade system, like a processor or a seller of scales or products containing scales. This could be somebody who acts as a, as a, as a regulator or there could, maybe there's scope for there to be self-regulation in this system. And again, I, I think regulation here should be designed through an in-depth understanding of the trade system to think about the actors and what, what they want um, in terms of use and trade of pangolins, what incentives they have, and how this links to the sourcing of the products and, and, and wider sustainability. And then finally, I think um, the report also suggests some broader points, because if there is social legitimacy and there is likely to be persistent demand for pangolin products, what are we going to do about supply? At the moment, pangolin populations in Western Central Africa, for example, are being overexploited, um, as far as we can tell. And unless there is an alternative supply, that looks likely to continue. So I would ask some questions here. Is there a role for commercial captive breeding, for example? <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and then finally, pangolin conservation, um, at least within the last decade, is, has a pretty poor track record, I think, of working with industry partners. So, for example, the traditional Chinese medicine sector. So I would argue that whatever we do going forward, pangolin conservationists, practitioners, academics, others, should be trying to work with the TCM sector much more closely to understand what their wants and needs are and see if there is a potential to work out a cohesive strategy to conserve pangolins that may involve some use as it currently takes place in China. So that's the last of my slides. Um, thanks for bearing with me through the coughs and I'm happy to uh, take questions that anybody might have later. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dan. Thanks for the presentation. Um, and um, I think one of the key points you've raised and you've reminded us is the long history of the use and trade of pangolins and um, the continued demand actually that um, exists, especially from China which obviously raises an interesting question about possible conservation um, efforts on the way forward. And there has actually been a, a question also in the chat box on this, um, asking whether pangolins can be captively raised for the purpose of mass production. And I think that's an um, interesting point and we'll come back to later also for um, the discussion. Um, uh, I encourage questions in the Q&A chat box. Um, please feel free to just put in any questions you might have um, and we'll get back to it um, after the last uh, presentation. And with that, I want to hand over to Saris now. Thank you, Christina. Thank you, Theo, and thank you, Dan. Let's see, waiting for the slides to come up. And uh, my presentation will build on the previous two speakers and expand into how the use of pangolins in TCM may have an impact in the coming years as TCM expands to other continents. Next slide, please. And my organization, the Environmental Investigation Agency, is an NGO that investigates and campaigns against environmental crime and abuse. We have four areas of work, which are climate, forest, wildlife and ocean. Next slide, next slide, please. For our work in wildlife, we campaign for policy changes and we are trying to strengthen law enforcement by conducting undercover investigations, sharing the intelligence together with law enforcement and partners, strengthening legal frameworks by submitting comments during public consultations and campaigning for reforms and raising awareness of emerging threats, such as the expansion of TCM. Next slide, please. For many years now, EIA has identified TCM use as a threat to endangered species. 
our work started on the use of tiger and leopard parts in pills and tonics, and then expanded into the use of pangolin scales as we started to note the rapid increase in the trafficking of pangolin parts. It's important to point out that TCM, like many other traditional medicine, fulfills a very important function in healthcare and is an important part of culture. TCM uses plants, animal parts, and minerals, and the animal ingredients only constitute a small part of the ingredient range. And as Stan pointed out in his presentation, the use actually varies from region to region according to the traditional availability of ingredients in that part of the country. Animal ingredients or any ingredients coming from rare species are not a must in any TCM formula, but can be replaced by other ingredients fulfilling the same function. However, currently, traders and pharmaceutical companies are playing an important role in sustaining the demand for the products using threatened species through their marketing. There are TCM practitioners, both inside and outside China now, calling for a stop of the use um, of species that are threatened or endangered in traditional Chinese medicine. And we would like to always highlight their voices so that we don't categorically label traditional medicine as something that is problematic or should be abolished. We need to recognize the value of their treatments as well. The China's wildlife protection law allows the commercial use of protected species, even those under the highest level of protection, which would include the pangolins. In 2020, the news about the removal of pangolin scales as an ingredient from the China pharmacopoeia was interpreted at the time by many as a ban on using pangolin scales. This was not the case. We conducted keyword searches in Chinese online and found 56 Chinese pharmaceutical companies advertising 64 pangolin scale medicines. We highlighted the findings through our smoke and mirrors report the problematic legal trade of pangolin medicine, China's flawed stockpile and TCM product certificate system, which includes the China National Wildlife Mark System. Our GI's latest online markets report used this much more powerful scanning tool. So the findings are wider in terms of range and the findings are particularly interesting, not just confirming again, the availability of products in China, but also in the US, Nepal, Hong Kong, and other regions. Sadly, it shows again that the market for pangolin medicine is still flourishing. The cascade tool will no doubt be very useful for developing and maintaining a surveillance of product availability and marketing not the least for rapid searches in different languages so that uh, we can use it to look into other markets such as those in Southeast Asia and those in other Belt and Road Initiative countries. This as China is pushing for the expansion of TCM abroad. Next slide, please. Over the past decade, hundreds of tons of smuggled pangolin scales have been seized by law enforcement globally. This reflects the gravity of the trafficking. At EIA, we maintain a public accessible comprehensive seizure database called the Global Environmental Crime Tracker. And as you can see, over the past two, three decades, the top countries for pangolin seizures are China, including the region of Hong Kong, Vietnam, Nigeria, Singapore, Malaysia, and Cameroon. And this clearly shows the trafficking is a transnational crime impacting Africa and Asian countries. Despite the large quantities seized, there has been no known pangolin scale destructions in China. The wildlife protection law allows for the seized wildlife and der derivatives to be utilized. And the process and criteria for uh, pangolin scales to be recognized into the stockpile is very opaque. And as Theo mentioned, far from all products containing pangolin parts display a wildlife mark, and many Chinese wild, uh, national wildlife marks cites the source of scales as unknown. And this, despite the special marking system, was originally developed to strengthen the resource protection and management of wildlife. 
in 2020 and 2021, there have been high profile convictions of government officials and TCM pharmaceutical companies and traders in China for the corruption linked to the issuing of wildlife trade permits and fraud involving these permits and the wildlife marks. Next slide, please. Traditional Chinese medicine is expanding domestically and internationally and doing it with state backing. The Chinese government is promoting TCM by branding it as a national treasure in terms of culture heritage. And it is part of the culture exchange pillar under the Belt and Road Initiative. MOUs have been signed between China and Africa through the Forum on China-African Cooperation, which is the main platform for bilateral collaboration between China and African countries to develop and increase the clinical use of traditional medicine. And such agreements in general would include the establishment of research centers, schools, and hospitals for the promotion of TCM. There is high acceptability of TCM amongst Africans due to the similarities between traditional African medicine and TCM in the use of natural ingredients, and often perceived as a more user-friendly type of medicine because people think that because the ingredients come from natural plants or animals and minerals, the side effects will be milder. So large Chinese pharmaceutical companies see Africa as a huge potential market and a good investment opportunity. The rich biodiversity of Africa and existing supply and trading platform in form of traditional African medicine markets makes it easy for TCM companies to source, and exist, uh, source existing and novel ingredients. One of the biggest pharmaceutical companies in China have repeatedly said in media interviews that they plan to set up the food chain from sourcing to supply in Africa and promote TCM amongst Africans. So as TCM spreads beyond China, the potential consumer base, considering the populations of China and African countries, the demand for pangolins and other species can increase rapidly. And in many cases, African countries lack the regulation for TCM ingredients and products. For example, TCM ingredients may be imported or exported as agricultural goods and pills can be misdeclared and process ingredients can be difficult for local enforcement to recognize. All this would be adding fuel to the rampant trafficking. Next slide, please. So earlier this year, we published a cautionary tale based on our undercover investigation in Uganda. And this is the story of a TCM trader called Ma Jin Ru, who received powerful backing from the state uh, in China and the TCM pharmaceutical sector due to her years of experience working as a trader. She moved to Uganda to source pangolins and other precious TCM animal ingredients specifically. And she set up a company and a captive breeding center for pangolins in Uganda, sourced and exported tons of pangolin scales to China. And according to our intelligence, she is now planning to launder her stockpiles of scales through pharmaceutical production because export of scales has become very difficult since the uplisting of pangolins in 2016. Next slide, please. African pangolins are not supposed to be used for TCM according to China's regulations. So Ma successfully run her business by building a powerful network of government contacts in China and Uganda, uh, and also corruption through her powerful links and bribery. She on purposely kept the license for captive breeding and export under different names to avoid scrutiny. And she misdeclared uh, mis her three ton pangolin scales shipment to China in order to clear customs, given that the African species are not allowed for medicinal use. Her business partners in Uganda and China have all been linked to the illegal wildlife trade, either through past arrests, ongoing investigation or convictions and her operation in Uganda, unfortunately, remains untouched. So um, next slide. I understand that we are going to discuss recommendations a bit earlier, so I'm not going to talk through all these points, but 
all in all, we find that the current permit system is very vulnerable to exploitation. And especially with the government push to expand TCM, any legal channel becomes vulnerable to laundering exploitation. And we'll come back to this. So I'll pass the mic back for general discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sarah, for a really fascinating presentation. And I have to say, I'm particularly interested in the promotion of pangolin and well TCM products actually along uh, the BRI. And um, there's so much that we could talk about when it comes to this, but maybe that's actually enough to even organize a separate webinar on uh, the promotion of, of um, TCM products and um, pangolin derived products as well as long, along the BRI. Let's so, focus on TO's report for now. <laughs> exactly. But um, it, it is truly fascinating. So thank you very much for sharing also some of your insights. Um, you've All three of you have already raised uh, the question of recommendations and, and the, the way forward a little bit in your presentations. But um, I particularly want to hand back to uh, Theo now maybe to start um, and explain a bit more about the recommendations of this particular report. I know you've structured it around uh, four different stakeholders groups, but maybe you can tell us a little bit um, what you think is uh, most needed on the way forward. Yeah, yeah, thanks a lot. Um, I'll just be quick on the on the recommendation in the hope that it can uh, kick off further discussion. Uh, can you display my slides again, just for people to, so that people are able to track. Exactly. Uh, just a slide before. The previous one, sorry. Exactly. Um, so yeah, we've divided our recommendations uh, uh, depending on which stakeholders they are addressed to. Uh, but before I'm going into the detail, I need to reflect on an offline discussion I had with Cerise. And to mention the fact that these recommendations are actually grounded on the findings that we did for this specific report that deals with a specific market segment of the pangolin trade of the yeah trade of uh, pangolin derived products that is online that is very supply side and that is actually mostly uh, us and and or english speaking and and china doing something that would uh have that would be more overarching looking at both sides of uh of the supply and the demand Looking at those factor would likely enable us to make more overarching recommendations, but we are not quite there yet. So, based on this report, we recommended to the SFGA, so the basically Chinese authorities, the State Forestry Investment Administration, that um, China's national wildlife protection law should be altered so that online platforms selling penguin duras products has have the same duties as real world retail shops, which is especially including uh, displaying the China national wildlife mark on product pa packaging pictures so that online customers purchasing TCM drugs will be explained that these drugs does contain pangolin scales. However, these China national wildlife marks, CNMW logos, need to be much more transparent, much more clear. We've found countless issues with uh, these logos uh, I'll refer to you to the, to, the, to the report if you want more details, but for instance, basically drugs like uh, Taitawan, who uh, contain various endangered species, including leopards, snake turtles, pangolins, and the like, they would only display one specific species. So if for some reason you are buying Taitawan and you find that it contains snakes and you don't see a problem in that, you will, it will mislead you into thinking that there is nothing else, but there is also a leopard boy pangolin scales, etc. Chinese authorities and online TCM e-commerce platform in China must ensure that customers are currently informed about the presence of pangolin scales in various TCM drugs. And we must add how it contributes to the to this to its extinction. The things that based on discussions I had with uh, with Chinese experts in the past, most I guess that most people in China consuming TCM drugs are not really 
aware of the impact that the, the TCM drugs uh, business has on pangolins. They are not really, although it might have changed with, with COVID now, but people are not really aware of what pangolins are and why it's so critically endangered. So this needs to be uh, explained more clearly to consumers. <coughs> Another recommendation that we have is on agents websites, which are basically a major loophole in the in the current law, and they need to be since they are contributing to the the online trade in uh, TCM derived in sorry, pangolin derived TCM drugs uh, trade. Uh, they should be held accountable for the role they play in facilitating uh, criminal activities and for the the trafficking of pangolin derived products. Basically, they should be uh, bound by the same rules and regulations as uh, other uh, actors. That's for the China part. There are much more, many more recommendations in the reports, but I don't really have time to go through all of them right now. But I will, uh, on the next slide, I will be talking about recommendations for other actors, including private actors that are outside of China, which very uh, bluntly. Uh, should stop importing, selling, and promoting penguin derived products uh, in compliance with most national and definitely with international laws. Uh, and to customs and law enforcement agencies outside of China, uh, they need to be aware that the online trade of penguin derived products across international border is not still happening, but it's actually happening. And they need to take action to all the companies and individuals involved um, responsible for that. As our work uh, within GI, we've been reaching out to uh, private companies. Uh, when, when I mentioned private sector engagement, on the China side, honestly, it's been not really a success, but we've been able to reach out to other companies uh, in Western countries. And if we've also been able to liaise with law enforcement agencies that are working on uh, transnational organized crime. And we did uh, feed them with information and intelligence about which companies in the Netherlands, in the UK, in the US, is actually actively promoting the trade of uh, Bengal Indira products. That's all for the recommendations that we have. We have several questions in the chat. Uh, and uh, I'm sure that Dan or Ceres might have want to add more uh, details and on, on, on this specific issue. Thank you, Theo. And exactly, I wanted to ask if um, Dan or uh, Serum also would like to share their thoughts and maybe um, also expand a little bit more on the key recommendations of your research. Um, I also wanted to ask you, there's a question in the chat box that suggests that um, pangolin distribution countries should strengthen law, as should strengthen anti-poaching law enforcement and crack down on trafficking gangs. Um, and what, how you see this, uh, maybe you can add this a little bit into your um, answer. Thank you. Happy to come in, Christina. Um, thanks to Theo for outlining the recommendations. I think recommendations three, four, and five look look really sound. I think you know China has done and is continuing to seek to regulate the legal trade in, in pangolin scales and, and products containing scales. I think what's needed is that for that regulation to be effective there are clearly some questions around sourcing and where scales are coming from and it would help the international community to have more information on that but when it comes to the effectiveness of those regulations i'm encouraged by the fact that the the sfga is looking at a redesign for the, the chinese national wildlife mark i think that's really encouraging um, in terms of process there when when regulations such as this are introduced typically regulators um uh, are over simple in designing regulations and that can often work to the detriment of the, the regulations when it comes to implementation. You can deal with some of this by better designing regulation and I don't know the details of the process that the SFJ is going through but um, hopefully they're consulting with different stakeholders that are involved in the trade system because if they do and they seek input into the regulatory design through consultations or other processes Processes like that are key to actually achieving higher compliance um, once these regulations are implemented. So hopefully that's that's taking place. And that, that's my sort of key thought on that one. Um, when it comes to, to laws and regulations and strengthening laws and regulations in range countries, I mean, in Asia, pangolin populations are the species, at least are protected 
um, under national law uh, in most countries in Asia and, and similarly in, in Africa. What's really needed here is if we're going to concentrate on law enforcement is increasing the probability of apprehension that would-be offenders are actually deterred from committing an offence, for, for example, illegally extracting pangolins from their habitats. There's research that's criminological in focus that's looked at crimes, mainly in the global north, but a whole range of different crimes from poaching to theft to property crimes, financial crimes. And it all indicates that it's not just penalties that are important. In fact, it's likelihood of apprehension. And that's more important. If there's a high penalty, but there's a low chance of a would-be offender being apprehended in the field, then they're not going to be deterred by that. And the, on, the, on, the illegal extraction is going to be ongoing. And so I would actually argue that here, what we need is, is not so much a focus on the, the legislation itself, which is strong in many places, for sure it can be strengthened in others, but what we need is a focus on what's happening in those landscapes where pangolins occur. If there is sufficient resources to put into law enforcement, then fine, but we also need to be thinking about the legitimacy of the, the laws and regulations that apply among the local people that live there. It might be what's actually needed to achieve conservation of pangolins at some of these key sites where they exist is some sort of institutional reform. And this is where governments will need to be brave and think about uh, things like property rights. And maybe there's a need to devolve property rights, access and use rights to pangolins and other wildlife, which means that people are a better place there to, to conserve the species because they have some ownership over those resources. There's lots of um, analysis that is economic in focus and institutional in focus that demonstrates that where um, well-assigned uh, property rights are put in place, that, that's a real key tool to ensuring that any wildlife use is, is sustainable. Thank, Thank you, you very much, Dan. Um, over to you, Sarahs. Uh, yes, I um, firstly, I would like to go back a bit on the current China National Wildlife Mark. So the, that system was actually started more as a pilot, and that is why you don't see it used on all protected species. It's only on certain species, and only in the beginning, it was even only on certain products. So that can explain partly why we are seeing a lot of products either lacking the mark or the mark itself is very unclear, not specifying the species of wildlife, not specifying the source of wildlife. Um, supposedly, there's an online platform where you can use the code to display on the marking, enter that code, and the system is supposed to give you information about the species and the source. Um, however, even if you use that system, a lot of times you don't get the species and you don't get the source, it's just unknown. And a few months ago, actually, there was a public consultation for the formalizing of this system. Uh, I'm not sure entirely whether that's what you were referring to, Theo, in your recommendation. No. Uh, it was a few, year, a few months ago that document came out, which expands the China National Wildlife Mark system to the list, the full list of protected species and their products. We submitted comments. We don't really know what's going on because it has been um, almost half a year now. Has not been any formal regulation published yet. So we will see the actual impact once that text has been formalized and come into force. The issue as EIA sees it is that even though there is a good thinking behind that we need to regulate and mark the products, traders and pharmaceutical companies have not been following the regulations. As Dan pointed out, the laws may be there, but they are not being followed. And the process is very opaque. Um, we also follow verdicts in China to understand what um, cases have been happening involving TCM industry and the smuggling of pangolin scales. And there have been court verdicts of major cases where they describe bribery in trying to attempt, uh, trying to get their smuggled in pangolin scales or, or imported pangolin scales certified as the state stockpile. Um, but when I then try to look for criteria and papers you need to submit to get that certification, couldn't find anything. And yeah. I 
we contacted our NGO partners in China, other specialists, no one could give an answer. The only application form we could find was once you get the stockpile recognized, how you then obtain the next permit to trade it. And the CNWM itself seems to be very prone to fraud. Uh, there's a major case where the pharmaceutical company basically contracted a copying company and just copy out themselves loads and loads of these marks and stick onto their products. So from our side, we do think that there is a need to strengthen even the policy itself because as the system currently stands, it's very prone to corruption and fraud. But of course, this is complicated because as soon as you ban something, you risk driving the trade underground. And I do agree with Dan on that it's important to include multiple stakeholders, so ideally some kind of interdisciplinary participatory design, um, which is probably easier to achieve in some countries than others. It's a process that we all need to try to work together and achieve, I think. So from our side, the recommendations as they currently stand would be to further tighten the permissions to use endangered species in TCM, including captive bred specimens because of the laundering risk and also tackle corruption and make the processes much more transparent. So we can then provide more constructive feedback than rather than just saying, just let's ban everything. No, no. no I, 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 what you said is super interesting and it's really reflects on what we, what we found out, like what you explained about uh, this tracking system that's supposed to work when you input the code that is present on each CNMW logo. I did use uh, all the codes I found in the CNMW logos we detected throughout the study and it never, never actually worked. And that's actually part of one recommendation we have in the report, which is to improve the transparency of the system. If, I mean, the system obviously <coughs> needs to be uh, improved and better regulated, but uh, one way of doing so would be to improve the transparency globally of the supply chain, who is authorized, who is giving authorizations, what are the criteria, and that system, which is actually a good idea, like the ability to track as a consumer if I don't want to have uh, too much of a, a impact on the environment and on the extinction of species, I should be able to uh, know if the, the, the products I'm consuming are actually respecting what, they are, what the regulations. Uh, for the time being, it doesn't work. We've seen the discussion, I mean, we've seen signs of the discussions that the CNMW system is going to be, is going through some changes. We've tried to reach out to the SFGA without success, but um, it's not really something that is only relevant to the TCM industry. It's wider issues within China that are transparency and corruption issues that they exist. And as you uh, circling back to, to, to your very interesting presentation on the BRI, the, one of the issues that we, uh, one of the concerns that we have right now is how we will see um, potential problematic practices within China disseminate to uh, other countries, including source countries for, for various uh, wildlife parts and, and, and endangered uh, species. So it's, I mean, it's a different study. It's not something that we've done for this report, but uh, among the, 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 the leads that we have for uh, future research, we would like to see how China is implementing safeguards uh, as part of uh, its Point ventures and like the, the ex, its expand, uh, economic integration and expansion along the along the BI. What does it mean for the TCM industry? Are the malpractices that that are happening in China today are they going to disseminate to other countries? Are they going to reproduce, creating a much an even more uh, problematic system and even less transparent uh, system that will that is uh, a serious cause for concern. From a, from a conservation and uh, an illicit trade uh, perspective. 
Thanks, Theo. And um, we're actually already a little bit over time, but um, <laughs> I see there are still, well, it's actually, I think, two questions related um, to, together. Um, so I was wondering if um, anybody um, of the panelists would like to have some, like to answer it. Um, there is a question on the obstacles to submitting wildlife ingredients in TCM and um, any other concluding remarks before we wrap up this um, webinar. I can um, try to answer on the obstacles. I think there is not so much obstacles as much as the will to do it. Um, as said previously, there is a strong marketing force, uh, both from the company side and also from the government side. And all the time reiterating the value of these precious ingredients. The traditionally, TCM doctors themselves would be much more flexible because the ingredients are selected for their properties. And for each TCM property, you will have many, many ingredients fulfilling that function. So from that perspective, I don't think there is an obstacle from the treatment side of things, but uh, from the policy side and the marketing side. Thank you, Sarah. Then, any final remarks? Yeah, I think I think one obstacle is is a lack of research on consumers that are using products containing pangolin scales in China. As I said in my presentation, pangolin scales and products containing scales have been used for a long, long time in the country, but there's actually little research on consumers. And if we had some insight on what their preferences are what the attributes of the products are that they value highly. Um, you know, the nature of, of demand for pangolin products, is it elastic or inelastic or somewhere in between, for example? These are the sorts of insights that we could then use to think about future demand and, and how we can go about meeting that and how, and, and how we would do that. So um, like I've said in response to, to previous questions, it's really, a, for me, about understanding the system and the consumers are part of the system and then understanding the other actors that are involved and thinking about what they want, their incentives, and seeing if it's possible to coherently, among all different stakeholders, design a system that can allow ongoing use, if that's what is wanted by key stakeholders, but also in a way that allows wild pangolin populations to be secured and, and protected. Thank you. Thank you. Final words to Theo and uh, maybe final. also an outlook on future research studies that you're already working on related to pangolins. Well, uh, related to pangolins, you need to, you need to follow up with the work of uh, the co-author of the report, Simon Hayson. She, I know she's involved in, in other uh, pangolin work. Um, our next report focusing on Vietnam, those also include uh, some um, part of the data set is actually on the trade of uh, pangolin derived products in Vietnam. And uh, since we are talking about the consumer demand, we do also have another program uh, jointly with a researcher from the University of Copenhagen, uh, but based in Vietnam, uh, looking at uh, consumer demand patterns for tiger bone uh, and tiger glue. But there is if this works, and I think it is actually working pretty well, we should definitely look for uh, reproducing the same study uh, for the demand of pangolin products in China and maybe uh, in Southeast Asia. And my final words actually, if you are interested in the topic, read our report and come, come to us with questions and remarks. Thank you very much, Theo. Thank you, really a big thank you to all three of you um, for your contributions, your presentations, and for being so open and answering all the questions. Thank you everybody um, for joining this webinar today. Uh, goodbye. See you soon. Thank you all for your time. Cheers, bye for now. <laughs>